I Love Thee by Thomas Hood I love thee, I love thee, tis all that I can say. It is my vision in the night, my dreaming in the day, the very echo of my heart, the blessing when I pray. I love thee, I love thee, is all that I can say. I love thee, I love thee, is ever on my tongue. In all my proudest poesy that chorus still is sung. It is the verdict of my eyes amidst the gay and young. I love thee, I love thee, a thousand maids among. I love thee, I love thee, thy bright hazel glance, the mellow lute upon those lips whose tender tones entrance. But most, dear heart of hearts, thy proofs that still these words enhance, I love thee, I love thee, whatever be thy chance. To the ancient Egyptians, death marked the end of one journey and the beginning of another. After death, all ancient Egyptians believed that they must leave behind the green, fertile farmlands of Egypt and the waters of the River Nile to travel to the afterlife. They hoped that the afterlife would be a perfect place that resembled the beautiful landscape of the Egypt they had left behind. It was called the Field of Reeds. But to reach the afterlife, they had to make a dangerous and frightening journey. Their spirit had to cross the netherworld, which was the land of the dead, ruled by the god Osiris. Hail to you, Osiris. Turn your face to the west, that you may illumine the two lands with fine gold. Those who were asleep stand up to look at you, for to you belong eternity and everlasting. The ancient Egyptians believed that it was very important to prepare for this journey. How would they ward off hostile spirits and poisonous snakes? How would they avoid burning fire and scalding water? And why did the monstrous devourer always look so hungry? When wealthy ancient Egyptians died, their bodies were mummified. The mummy was placed in a tomb with special objects to protect it and to help the dead face the perils of the netherworld. One of the objects was a roll of magic spells and pictures. This is now known as the Book of the Dead. The mummy stayed in the tomb but its bar spirit, in the shape of a bird, could fly away from the tomb to explore the netherworld and to try and find a way through. In order to do this, the spirit of the dead person would have to pass through gates that were guarded by the gods and avoid being caught in their nets. They would have to battle with snakes and crocodiles and protect themselves against bloodthirsty monsters the dead person used magic and spells from the Book of the Dead to help them overcome these obstacles. Oh, you with a spine who would work your mouth against this magic of mine. No crocodile which lives by magic shall take it away. And at the end of each day, the bar spirit returned to the mummy in the tomb. The final and most important stage in the journey of the dead was the trial in the Hall of Judgment. The dead person's heart was weighed against the feather of truth. If their heart proved too heavy, they would be condemned and eaten by the monstrous devourer. If their heart balanced on the scales, the dead person would be allowed to enter and to remain forever 
in a perfect world, traveling across the skies with the sun god Ra, or tending their crops in a perfect landscape that resembled the green fertile banks of their beloved river Nile. Are you prepared to make the same journey? Can you discover how to use the spells of the Book of the Dead to help you on your way? It's time now to go into the exhibition and meet the god Osiris and the monstrous devourer. So we'll go no more a-roving by Lord Byron. So we'll go no more a-roving so late into the night though the heart be still as loving and the moon be still as bright. For the sword outwears its sheath and the soul wears out the breast and the heart must pause to breathe and love itself have rest. Though the night was made for loving and the day returns too soon, yet we'll go no more a-roving by the light of the moon. Funeral Blues by W. H. Jordan Stop all the clocks. Cut off the telephone. Prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone. Silence the pianos and with muffled drum Bring out the coffin. Let the mourners come. Let aeroplanes circle moaning overhead, scribbling on the sky the message, He is dead. Put crepe bows round the white necks of the public doves. Let the traffic policemen wear black cotton gloves. He was my north, my south, my east and west. My working week and my Sunday rest. My noon, my midnight, my talk, my song. I thought that love would last forever. I was wrong. The stars are not wanted now. Put out every one. Pack up the moon and dismantle the sun. Pour away the ocean and sweep up the wood. For nothing now can come to any good. From the Princess by Alfred Lord Tennyson Now sleeps the crimson petal, now the white. Nor wave the cypress in the palace walk. Nor winks the gold fin in the porphyry font. The firefly wakens. Waken thou with me. Now droops the milk-white peacock like a ghost. And like a ghost, she glimmers onto me. Now lies the earth all Danai to the stars. And all thy heart lies open unto me. Now slides the silent meteor on and leaves a shining furrow as thy thoughts in me. Now folds the lily all her sweetness up and slips into the bosom of the lake. So fold thyself, my dearest, thou, and slip into my bosom and be lost in me. Minute 130 by William Shakespeare my mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, 
treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. From Romeo and Juliet, Act 5, Scene 3, by William Shakespeare. O oh, my love, my wife, death that hath sucked the honey of thy breath hath had no power yet upon thy beauty. Thou art not conquered. Beauty's ensign yet is crimson in thy lips and in thy cheeks and death's pale flag is not advanced there. Tybalt, liest thou there in thy bloody sheet? Oh, what more favour can I do to thee than with that hand that cut thy youth in twain to sunder his that was thine enemy? Forgive me, cousin. Ah, dear Juliet, why art thou yet so fair? Shall I believe that unsubstantial death is amorous, and that the lean, abhorred monster keeps thee here in dark to be his paramour? For fear of that I still will stay with thee, and never from this palace of dim night depart again. Here, here will I remain, with worms that are thy chambermaids. Oh, here will I set up my everlasting rest, and shake the yoke of inauspicious stars from this world-wearied flesh. Eyes, look your last. Arms take your last embrace, and lips owe oh, you the doors of breath, seal with a righteous kiss a dateless bargain to engrossing death. Come, bitter conduct, come, unsavoury guide. Thou desperate pilot, now at once run on the dashing rocks thy seasick weary bark. Here's to my love. The sea is calm tonight, the tide is full, the moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast, out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air, only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon-blanched land, listen. You hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return, up the high strand, begin and cease and then again begin, with tremulous cadence slow, and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah! Love, let us be true to one another. For the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here, as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight where ignorant armies clash by night. He's recognized me, thought Jonathan, waiting for the denunciation. He's seen my photograph, listened to my description. In a minute, he'll stop smiling. I'm Dickie Roper, a lazy voice announced as the hand closed round Jonathan's and briefly owned it. My chaps booked some rooms here, rather a lot of them. 
How do you do? Belgravia slur, the proletarian accent of the vastly rich. They had entered each other's private space. How very good to see you, Mr. Roper, Jonathan murmured. English voice to English voice. Welcome back, sir. And poor you, what a perfectly ghastly journey you must have had. Wasn't it rather heroic to venture aloft at all? No one else has, I can tell you. My name's Pine. I'm the night manager. He's heard of me, he thought, waiting. Freddy Hamid told him my name. What's old Meister up to these days? Roper asked, his eyes slipping away to the beautiful woman. She was at the newsstand, helping herself to fashion magazines. Her bracelets kept falling over her hand, while with the other she continually pushed back her hair. Tucked up with his oval teen and a book, is he? Hope it's a book, must say. Jeds, how you doing, darling? Adores magazines. Addict. Hate the things, myself. It took Jonathan a moment to realize that Jeds was the woman. Not Jed, a single man, but Jeds, a single woman, in all her varieties. Her chestnut head turned far enough to let them see her smile. It was puckish and good-humored. I'm just fine, darling, she said bravely, as if she were recovering from a knock. Herr Meister is unavoidably tied up tonight, I'm afraid, sir, said Jonathan, but he does enormously look forward to seeing you in the morning when you're rested. You English pine, sound it. To the corsair. Wise man. The pale gaze wanders away again, this time to the reception desk, where the camel hair coat is filling in forms for Fräulein Eberhardt. You proposing marriage to that young lady, Corky? Roper calls. That'll be the day, he asks Jonathan in a lower tone. Major Corcoran, my assistant, he confides with innuendo. Nearly there, chief, Corky drawls and lifts a camel hair arm. He squared his legs and pushed out his rump like somebody about to play a croquet shot. And there's a tilt to his haunches that by nature or intent suggests a certain femininity. A heap of passports lies at his elbow. Only got a copy of a few names, God's sake, not a 50-page contract, Corks. It's the new security, I'm afraid, sir, Jonathan explains. The Swiss police insist. There seems to be nothing we can do. The beautiful Jeds has chosen three magazines, but needs more. She's perched one slightly scuffed boot pensively on its long heel, with the toe pointing in the air. Sophie used to do the same. Mid-twenties, Jonathan thinks. Always will be. Been here long then, Pine. Wasn't here last time around, was he, Frisky? We'd have noticed a stray young Brit. Nor we, said the blazer eyeing Jonathan through an imaginary gun slit. Cauliflower ears, Jonathan noticed. Blonde hair going on white. Hands like axe heads. I make it six months, Mr. Roper, almost of the day. Where were you before that? Cairo, Jonathan replied, light as a spark. The Queen Nefertiti. Time passes like time before a detonation. But the carved mirrors of the lobby do not shatter at the mention of the Queen Nefertiti Hotel. The pilasters and chandeliers hold still. Like he did you, Cairo? Loved it. What made you leave the place then if you were so high on it? Well, you did actually. Prospero's Farewell to His Magic by William Shakespeare Our revels now are ended. These our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits, and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, 
yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Hamlet Soliloquy by William Shakespeare To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. To die, to sleep, no more. And by sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished to die, to sleep. To sleep perchance to dream, aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of disprized love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns, puzzles the will, and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sickly door with the pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pitch and moment with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Bader and the Swan by W. B. Yeats A sudden blow, the great wings beating still above the staggering girl, her thighs caressed by the dark webs, her nape caught in his bill, he holds her helpless breast upon his breast. How can those terrified vague fingers push the feathered glory from her loosening thighs? And how can body, laid in that white rush, but feel the strange heart beating where it lies? A shudder in the loins engenders there the broken wall, the burning roof and tower, and Agamemnon dead. Being so caught up, so mastered by the brute blood of the air, did she put on his knowledge with his power? before the indifferent beak could let her drop. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized on a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Thou, by the Indian Ganges side, shouldst rubies find. I, by the tide of Humber, would complain. I would love you 
ten years before the flood, and you should, if you please, refuse till the conversion of the Jews. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires and more slow. A hundred years should go to praise thine eyes, and on thy forehead gaze. Two hundred to adore each breast, but thirty thousand to the rest. An age at least to every part, and the last age should show your heart. For, lady, you deserve this state, nor would I love at lower rate. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near, and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. Then worms shall try that long-preserved virginity, and your quaint honour turn to dust, and into ashes all my lust. The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. Now, therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, now let us sport us while we may, and now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chapped power. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball, and tear our pleasures with rough strife, thorough the iron gates of life. Thus, Though we cannot make our son stand still, yet we will make him run. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out, even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. As I Walked Out One Evening by W. H. Auden As I walked out one evening, walking down Bristol Street, the crowds upon the pavement were fields of harvest wheat, and down by the brimming river I heard a lover sing, under an arch of the railway, love has no ending. I'll love you, dear, I'll love you, till China and Africa meet, and the river jumps over the mountain, and the salmon sing in the street. I'll love you till the ocean is folded and hung up to dry, and the seven stars go squawking like geese about the sky. The years shall run like rabbits, for in my arms I hold the flower of the ages and the first love of the world. But all the clocks in the city began to whir and chime. Oh, let not time deceive you. You cannot conquer time. In the burrows of the nightmare, where justice naked is, time watches from the shadow and coughs when you would kiss. In headaches and in worry, vaguely life leaks away, and time will have his fancy. Tomorrow or today. Into many a green valley drifts the appalling snow, time breaks the threaded dances and the diver's brilliant bow. Oh, plunge your hands in water, plunge them in up to the wrist, stare, stare in the basin and wonder what you've missed. The glacier knocks in the cupboard, the desert sighs in the bed, and the crack in the teacup opens a lane to the land of the dead. Where the beggars raffle the banknotes, and the giant is enchanting to Jack, and the lily white boy is a roarer, and Jill goes down on her back. Oh, look, look in the mirror, 
O oh, look in your distress. Life remains a blessing, although you cannot bless. O oh, stand, stand at the window, as the tears scald and start. You shall love your crooked neighbour with your crooked heart. It was late, late in the evening. The lovers, they were gone. The clocks had ceased their chiming, and the deep river ran on. I will be the first man to kiss you, to bed you. Whether you come willingly or not, you will be mine, and mine alone, do you understand? Love After Love by Derek Walcott The time will come when with elation you will greet yourself arriving at your own door in your own mirror and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread. Give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit. Feast on your life. Go placidly amid the noise and haste, and remember what peace there may be in silence. As far as possible without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. Speak your truth quietly and clearly, and listen to others. Even the dull and the ignorant, they too have their story. Avoid loud and aggressive persons. They are vexations to the spirit. If you compare yourself with others, you may become vain and bitter. For always there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interested in your own career, however humble. It is a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs, for the world is full of trickery. But let this not blind you to what virtue there is. Many persons strive for high ideals, and everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself. Especially do not feign affection. Neither be cynical about love, for in the face of all aridity and disenchantment, it is perennial as the grass. Take kindly the counsel of the years, gracefully surrendering the things of youth. Nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden misfortune. But do not distress yourself with imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt, the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God. Whatever you conceive him to be, and whatever your labors and aspirations, in the noisy confusion of life, 
keep peace with your soul, with all its sham drudgery and broken dreams, it is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful, cheerful. Strive, strive to be happy. To be happy. May I feel, said he, by E. E. Cummings. May I feel, said he, I'll squeal, said she, just once, said he, it's fun, said she. May I touch, said he, how much, said she, a lot, said he. Why not, said she. Let's go, said he, not too far, said she, what's too far, said he, where you are, said she. May I stay, said he. Which way, said she. Like this, said he. If you kiss, said she. May I move, said he. Is it love, said she. If you're willing, said he. But you're killing, said she. But it's life, said he. But your wife, said she. Now, said he. Ow, said she. Tip top, said he. Don't stop, said she. Oh, no, said he. Go slow, said she. Come, said he, um, said she, you're divine, said he, you are mine, said she.